So thanks for being here, everybody. It's nice to see people here in person and people online. We've got about four people here in the room. So it's, yeah, it's always fun to, to gather. So this is a group that's been meeting for a, a few months and it's a drop-in group. Um, so welcome. I think we have a new person in person and um, I think Lee, this is Lee's first time. Um, but yeah, it's totally drop in and, and uh, the, the sessions should stand on their own, but we are moving through a list of 10 virtues, the 10 parami, um, and we're on number five, so we're about halfway through. We've covered generosity and ethical conduct and renunciation and wisdom, and now we're on to um, energy or effort or perseverance. These are different translations for the Pali word virya, which is related to English words like viral, virile, viral, um, vigor. So, so that will be the topic for today. And then moving on, just to give a preview, um, the next five are patience, truthfulness, resolution, goodwill, and equanimity or stability of heart. Um, Yeah, so diving into this parami of energy, I think because um, this word virya is, is used in different lists in Buddhism, and so I was thinking about what makes it, what what sort of makes it belong in this list of virtues, and um, maybe I'll read Ajahn Suchitta's description. So Ajahn is a Buddhist monk, and we've been or I've been, I don't know if anyone else is, <laughs> but it's sort of a, a guide that I'm using as I'm working through these. It's a book that is, uh, it's a great book. Um, so you're welcome to, to read that. Um, I think a few people are reading along, <laughs> um, but he has a, a nice description of each of the 10. And these are actually on cards that he, he made as sort of little, little daily reminders and maybe I'll send those out again to the email list if there's people new to the email list. And if you want to get on the email list, you can just send me an email or it's, it, you can click on a link in the calendar as well. Um, but he has a, a nice description for each. So I'll read his for this, uh, for energy. He says, recognizing my capacity for vigor or for distraction and lethargy, I aspire to use my energy for my long-term benefit and for the welfare of others. So I think the main point with this um, parami is just recognizing that it, it matters how we use our energy. And that's um, a pretty obvious thing, but I think, um, yeah, in terms of how it aligns with all the other paramis, it's really, I think of it as energy, just life energy is our, our most fundamental resource. And so then, yeah, it, it matters. It matters how we spend it. And, um, you know, that can make us feel maybe it can put some pressure on. So we might resist that. Um, and, but the question is, do we have to be tight in order to be, uh, yeah, good stewards, careful stewards, thoughtful stewards of our energy as this sort of primary resource that we have. We wake up in the morning and usually <laughs> we have at least some energy. And um, I know that there's things that we need to do in our life. So it's not completely uh, up to us, but just kind of, I think there's a lot in this arena that's about um, just being, being truthful about how we're using our energy. And that, you know, that's on more obvious levels, like how we spend our time, what are the activities we're doing, but also mental energy, you know, what do we think about and um, what do we dwell upon? And so I think, yeah, 
just to recognize that we need energy to do anything, even to pay attention. <laughs> you know, that's why meditation, it seems like we're just sitting here, but we know that it's not easy to um, direct the mind to the present moment, to being aware. So there is an energy involved. You know, those of us who have gone on meditation retreats, sometimes we come off the meditation retreat and we need some time to kind of recover because it could be intense, you know, even just, just to be aware, just to sustain awareness with whatever comes and goes um, in, in, yeah, in our minds, in our hearts, in our bodies. So the energy of, of presence is an energy. Um, it reminds me of a quote, I think Ajahn Chah said it, um, something about how we can use our energy in life to suffer, to create problems for ourselves, to get caught up in things, or we can use the energy in our life to be reflective and be aware and understand suffering, understand how our minds work. And the amount of work is the same. So this is a, a par paraphrase. I'm not sure who said it, but uh, it stuck with me that, you know, we can't really get out of, of this kind of predicament of being a being with energy that sort of feels compelled and is, we have to, to spend it and we have to use it. And that's just sort of like a definition of life. Like what is life without energy? And, and energy is just always moving, you know, even again, if we're on a meditation retreat, outwardly not doing much, but we still eat, you know, we spend that energy. So the mind, you know, is always thinking, always processing, and the body is always doing its thing, processing. And that's just kind of the basics. And then there's, yeah, out of the mind, there's our intentions and, you know, goals, aspirations. Yeah, and I think just speaking for myself, I mean, I think generally we have different relationships to energy and to effort. And I think we can have a lot of baggage around them. I think Mark Nunberg, the guiding teacher here, once said, and it stuck with me that maybe the thing we take most personally is energy. You know, we can really feel, you know, when, when we feel really energized, we can, we just feel so good. Like you go for a run or whatever, you exercise and just that high of, of energy can feel so good. Um, and similar or on the opposite side, when we don't have energy, feel depleted, you know, just how we can take that personally and you know just how heavy that can feel so this is really yeah a primary yeah definition if there's anything we're sort of you know in any given moment sort of assessing how am i doing it probably has something to do with energy a good friend of mine instead of saying how how are you or how's it going he'll often start our interactions by asking me how's my energy and it kind of catches me off guard <laughs> he's a meditation practitioner but I appreciate it because it, it invites me to really check and be honest and to not take it as personally. You know, it's like, oh, I'm really tired or my energy is really wiry or whatever it might be. But that's just, yeah, the nature of the body and the mind. Um, yeah, it kind of feels like this current, kind of this electric current. And sometimes it's dull and maybe kind of clouded and other times maybe it's really bright and sometimes it's maybe too bright or it feels too bright and it's kind of um yeah maybe needs some settling or just some dispersing or some kind of evening out smoothing out but yeah kind of our habitual relationships to energy and effort and maybe views that we have or identities that we may have uh, or just yeah how we we tend to relate to just that that fact of life of um, of energy um, we might we might sort of have a habit of holding back or kind of yeah being cautious or fearful with energy and we might have the habit of kind of really being exuberant and kind of really kind of chasing energy and pushing with it, maybe being forceful. 
And uh, all of that, I think, can come from identifying with that, with energy or just with, with life energy, which is totally understandable. Again, like it's one of the most basic attributes of being alive. But it's really what's more important from, from the Buddhist point of view is less sort of like, do I have enough energy or not enough or, um, but more, where is that energy being directed? And that's really then the source for energy that feels fulfilling and that we're using that resource in a way that we feel good about and um, that leads to good results. And then it, it will still feel good. That sort of directing of energy kind of has, um, it's a more stable kind of energy than something maybe more superficial that we're pursuing. We put a lot of energy into it and then we get it, but it's disappointing. But putting energy into the paramis, say, like putting energy into generosity, putting energy into ethical conduct, it takes energy just to, to watch ourselves, to watch our conduct and be careful. It takes energy for renunciation to kind of hold back, you know, for some of us, there just might be a lot of momentum. I notice this sometimes just like, I really like music. So like, it just makes a lot of sense if there's a concert I want to go to that I would, I would just do that. But just even to pause and like, I don't have to do that just because I could, and it sounds fun. I could pause and, and check, well, what is, what does it feel like to want to do that? So there take, there's some energy in, in renunciation. So all of the parmi, as an example, are great places to put energy. And I think as I describe some of them, for me, it sort of feels a little bit like a different frame for energy. I think often we think of energy as just the energy of doing, doing stuff. And the more we do, <laughs> the better, you know, how productive are we? And it has to do with something tangible that we could show someone. Yeah, today I was joking with my roommate that all I did today <laughs> was make a, a funny video because I'm a musician and part of that is promoting. And so I made a funny video with some friends. Maybe I, I did a few other things. I prepared for this talk, but so that, <laughs> but even, yeah, so like, yeah, how, th this is just to kind of frame maybe how we might ordinarily think of this word energy and maybe any value judgments we have on it. But again, from the Buddhist point of view, the, the goal isn't to be the most productive person. The goal is to move in a direction that's for our long-term and others' long-term well-being. That's really the goal. Um, so these parami, um, support us in that. And so it's a different way of maybe thinking of energy. Uh, yeah, that's not just about accumulating or doing or accomplishing something, but um, yeah, the energy of, of awareness, like I was saying during the meditation, it has a very specific flavor and it's sort of what allows all the other energies to sort of be known clearly, be seen with wisdom and to settle. So I think that's just a kind of an opening reflection on, yeah, the energy can be used in a lot of different ways. I was thinking too about the energy of, of listening, uh, like a, a good therapist does and how much energy it takes to show up for someone in a, in a full way. And yet, you know, on the surface, it might seem like that person's not doing very much. But I think we all know, like, yeah, that it, it takes, you know, emotional energy, energetic energy <laughs> um, to pay attention with care, with openness. And even the parami that are, that do sound more active, that are more active, like resolution, um, you know, that might kind of have more of a, a warrior energy. Again, I think none of the, in no, rarely is it, is it uh, encouraged that we're sort of forcing anything. So even with resolution, 
I think of it more as a kind of a heart energy or a, a heart commitment where there's something that we're resonating with that we care about and we sort of want to remind ourselves. So it's sort of like the energy of, of remembering too, but kind of really highlighting it. Like when we make a mental note, like, don't forget that. Um, so really all of it ultimately is towards encouraging wholesome mind states and discouraging unwholesome, unskillful mind states. And then the question is just what, what are the supports for, for that? What encourages skillful mind states and what um, discourages unskillful mind states? There's a, a well-known discourse where the Buddha lays out four kinds of right effort. And it's basically what I just said, but in a little more detail. And I like this too, because it's a very um, delineated instruction kind of for what to do with our energy. Because I think that's one of the, one of the main um, obstacles for kind of a free flowing, kind of joyful uh, energy in our life is that we don't always know what to do. And um, that makes a lot of sense because there's a lot of different things we can do and there's a lot of competing things asking for our attention. So what I like about this framework is it's really general. The Buddha is not telling us exactly what to do, but he says, these are four kinds of right effort. And it's the effort to, maybe I'll just read from the discourse. He says, there is the case where a monastic generates desire, endeavors, activates persistence, upholds and exerts their intent for the sake of the non-arising of evil, unskillful dhammas that have not yet arisen. And dhammas in, in this context, we could just translate as mental qualities. So for the non-arising of evil, unskillful mental qualities, dhammas, that have not yet arisen, for the sake of abandoning evil, unskillful dhammas that have arisen, for the sake of the arising of skillful dhammas that have not yet arisen, and for the maintenance, non-confusion, increase, plenitude, development, and culmination of skillful dhammas that have arisen. So it's just this fourfold, um, yeah, instruction to prevent unskillful mind states and to abandon unskillful mind states that are already present and to develop skillful mind states that aren't present and to maintain and fulfill skillful mind states that are present. And I like that it's so all encompassing and I like that it includes um, qualities that aren't even present. So like, you know, I might, and I actually feel like that's one of the reasons to study the paramis is that we then have this list and we might be wondering like, I don't really know what to do with myself right now. Or yeah, and that's not quite clear what direction to move in. And then we might remember, oh yeah, there's this list of wholesome qualities Generosity, oh, maybe generosity is a possibility in some way in this moment. So it's sort of that looking out for what are skillful qualities that have not yet arisen that might arise. And then when there is a skillful quality that's present, you know, maybe we find that we're cleaning the bathroom or cleaning the kitchen as an act of generosity and it's just happening and, and we're enjoying it and just sort of that maintenance, that enjoying giving attention to that um, really, yeah, letting that be known. Yeah, this is, this is skillful. I can enjoy this. Um, and I think the, similarly with the, the first one of sort of guarding against preventing unskillful qualities from arising. Again, I think this is just really um, interesting because we might not think to guard against unskillful qualities that aren't arisen yet. Um, but it makes sense sort of to be alert because we know that unskillful qualities can arise, you know, and so it's just, and it doesn't have to be tight, but it's sort of this like, yeah, being on the lookout. And one of the ways that it's described is guarding the sense doors, which can sound, yeah, maybe tight, but I think for me, what it, 
points to is just just that we're we're always interested in awareness. We know that if we sort of are lax in our awareness and sort of at times, well, I was aware already a lot today. I'll just kind of kick my feet up. It's usually at those times, you know, where we might get caught up in something. So what is the kind of effort, you know, to can we imagine undertaking or keeping in mind these four efforts? in a way that's actually energizing and joyful and that doesn't just feel like, oh, I got, I'm constantly watching my mind and trying to squelch things, but, uh, but it actually could be a joy. It's like tending a garden. I was thinking about like a plant. If you had a plant that you were really caring for, it would make sense. You would sort of be guarding against potential harm. You would you know, take care of any harm that had come to the plant. You would want to develop, you know, if you wanted it to flower, you would be trying to make that happen, giving it fertilizer. And then if it was, you know, in full bloom, it was really happy, you would want to keep it that way. So in that way, um, yeah, I think this is a nice map just for kind of the four possibilities that we can always sort of be be aware of to some degree. How's the mind? What would be helpful here? And there's a lot we could say about the specifics in that, you know, what are the specific unskillful qualities and specific wholesome qualities. Um, but I think we could probably all, all name some of them. So I won't go into too much detail there, but, but leave that more as a general principle. So I want to talk about kind of more generally what supports us in even kind of approaching that uh, stage of making effort and feeling, um, yeah, getting to that point of, okay, I'm ready to sort of work with my mind. Uh, Because I think some of the time we're just not even in that arena. We're kind of not in that mindset because we have things to do or there's just life is hard and we're just kind of getting by. So just kind of what gets us to that point where we're sort of in a, in the game, like, yeah, I'm going to put forth some effort to be aware or, or to generate wholesome qualities or whatever it might be. So I think before we make any effort, we, we need some desire actually some motivation and that might be interesting because we might hear in buddhism that craving is the source of suffering Um, but we do need desire to practice or we wouldn't practice it's kind of desire that leads ultimately to the end of desire but we need some desire in order to motivate ourselves to practice So what are some of these motivations, these skillful motivations that can support us in in making effort, effort that's helpful? So the first is just that we need some sense that it's possible to work with our minds in a way that is skillful and useful. And so we could call this sadha. Sadha is the Pali word, and it can be translated as faith or conviction or confidence. Um... So some sense that, um, yeah, that there's something to do. Ajahn Suchito wrote in, uh, in the book on this chapter that sadha isn't belief, but the intuitive sense that there is meaning. So just on that really basic level, like life isn't just random. There's meaning. There's something to be done. And, you know, that even just reflecting on that. Oh, yeah, because I think... I mean, life is hard, and especially these days, there's just so many problems in the world and our attention is so scattered just by modern technology. Like we can just kind of feel like, I don't know about you, but like, yeah, floating in the seas of chance. But so just that sense sadha, that it's the intuitive sense that there is meaning. Oh, my life is meaningful. It matters. It matters what I do. It matters how I'm using my life. That can be a prompt uh, for, for looking for, well, okay, what, what will I do? What would be helpful? 
And basically, I think, I mean, we, we come across hopefully some teachings that are that resonate, that make sense. So there's some sense of inspiration or even just curiosity, initial interest. And then we sort of just have to go for it on some level, you know, probably all of us just to show up here tonight or the very first time we, you know, we went from maybe reading about meditation to coming and sitting. It's like, that's a bit of an act of faith. Like, I don't know that this will work, but, or be helpful, but it makes enough sense. People involved seem trustworthy enough. I'll try it out. And I think in my experience, it kind of just keeps going in that direction, just sort of having enough confidence in our good intentions that we, we say yes and try something, make some effort, and then trial and error, and we learn. We see how it goes. But, um, but doubt can be a really seductive sort of uh, um, obstacle or... Um, something that keeps us from making even that, that initial effort. So we don't have to have perfect confidence, but just enough to, to try something. Another source of motivation is uh, just this reflection that, uh, that our time and our resource, our energy, that it's all limited and it's unknown how long we'll be as healthy as we are. And, um, you know, in the suttas, it's even described sort of to be aware that we don't even know that our next breath will come. So on that level of like, oh, whoa, you know, so much of the time we just sort of take for granted this idea that, you know, the story of my life, yeah, yeah, today, so-so, and I'll, tomorrow and, and so on. We do have to plan logistically in life, but in the sense of what's really important, given that we don't know what's going to happen. Anything can happen at any time. And, um, and our mind is really what we have. <laughs> you know, so, so many things can change, you know, relationships, you know, livelihood, health, so the kind of this is a kind of reflection on vulnerability and and then what's important what what can we really rely on and the good news is that um, yeah, there is something that we can do we can do our best to develop our mind and, and get interested in our mind and heart, and that's really the most reliable kind of um, resource. And then another source of motivation can be goodwill, um, just caring, caring about our life, caring about others. Um, we know that it makes sense if we're learning about our own minds through meditation and mindfulness, we'll tend to um, cause less harm to ourselves and, and to others. So it's really, can this, this can be a source of, and really is, I think, uh, a primary source of motivation uh, for for practice and for what we do is this just the sense of caring and wishing well for ourselves and for others. But we can kind of bring that up. We can sort of um, notice that and recognize that, remember that. Another source of motivation is curiosity and interest. So just wanting to to know, wanting to understand, wanting to illuminate, and especially around this question of how the mind sort of creates suffering, creates problems for itself, you know, in familiar ways and habitual ways. Like there's something the mind's not seen here, and I don't quite know what it is, and it's sort of vexing. And and this is interesting, um, sort of like what I was saying earlier about desire, wholesome forms of desire, and they're even. You know, it's not like completely wholesome maybe, but something like this where we're sort of really wanting to understand, really wanting to um, improve. This is sort of a, a skillful use of 
what in Buddhism, the word conceit, mana, is sort of comparing mind. So it's like, no, I want to I wanna be that kind of person, not this kind of person. You know, if we, you know, you know, recently in my life is just noticing a lot of jealousy and sort of comparing and insecurity and then just kind of acting out of that in, in ways that really weren't helpful. And there was a certain point where it was just kind of like, I don't want to be that kind of person. And so that sort of like firmness of resolve and yeah. So, you know, even that sort of comparing mind or wanting to be, you know, that becoming, which ultimately, you know, a more peaceful abiding is just to understand that it's all just nature. Don't have to take it personally, but there are these sort of um, motivations that can get us to take responsibility for our minds and sort of, you know, like we were talking for the ethical conduct about wholesome forms of fear and remorse, even shame. We may not like that word, but, and in, in that reflection, it's um, part of it is to reflect on how we would feel if others, you know, knew that we were, going to do this unskillful thing. So it's this kind of skillful use of kind of peer pressure in a way. So I, I like, I've been noticing in some of my reading recently, just that some of these words even that we might take to be completely unskillful, like craving or conceit. I think the Buddha was flex, maybe more flexible than we think sometimes about words and um, it's really about what is the direction, what is the aim, what is, and, and basically are we moving from more kind of obviously unskillful to less, less unskillful? You know, there's one teaching about what to do with um, obsessive thinking or distracting thinking or unskillful thinking. And there's, it sort of starts with the most, um, with the intervention with the least side effects, like just be aware and recognize this is just thinking just and sometimes that's enough just when there's enough mindfulness it's just a thought being known and the mind lets go of identification but with sticky thoughts there's different levels of intervention and the very last one is compared to a strong person or two strong people grabbing hold of a weaker person and sort of like forcibly sort of restraining them and sometimes maybe that's what we have to do, but it's out of compassion. It's to sort of take care of ourselves or take care of others. And we really want to have skill on kind of that whole range. We want to be flexible. So these are just some examples of different motivations that can sort of energize us. And again, I, I, I like bringing in kind of ones that maybe are more on that spectrum because I think we really need to be creative. And, um, you know, it's really about with this parami of energy, it's kind of, yeah, it's, it's really like, it's our whole life. It's not just meditation. It's what are we doing with our life and our life energy? And I think we all know there's just a lot of play in there um, given, you know, all sorts of external factors and our own um, sort of energy swings throughout the day. And it's like this constantly moving target of, you know, what is supportive to keep the mind in a wholesome place, to keep it interested and engaged. And I think interest is, is a motivation that maybe we can overlook or we might think that it's, yeah, we might think, well, that meditation or mindfulness is all about being peaceful and serene. But there is a goal <laughs> when we're not fully at peace and awake and equanimous, then the goal is to move more in that direction. And so we can use our interest and we can use our kind of the activity of our mind, our, our intelligence. Well, that's where I want to be, you know, and, and what's supportive for that? And I think what that helps with is to get away from my, the idea of complete passivity. Like, oh, if I just didn't do anything, then I would be at peace. And that could be a strategy that we can try. 
But even that is something that we're doing. We're taking that on. Well, I'm just going to sit on my couch for five minutes and not do anything and notice all the intentions that arise, all the voices that I should be doing this, this and doing that, but I'm going to abide, you know, and just sort of notice that and, and see what happens. But that's, you know, that's an activity that we would take on because it might be helpful. And I think all of this goes sort of in the direction of taking responsibility for our energy and our efforts and taking joy in it. I think this is where joy comes in, where we're not just seeing ourselves as passive, um, yeah, leaves in the wind, but that we, we can work with our energies and we can try things out. And I think that's where joy comes in, where um, there's some sense, not that we have perfect clarity, but there's some sense, yeah, that's the direction I want to move in and I'm going to try something. I think we all know just that there's an inherent joy in applying ourselves wholeheartedly to something, even again, like cleaning the bathroom or, you know, we can do that begrudgingly, but when we just do it because it's what needs to be done, whatever it might be, um, yeah, we can check to see if there's a joy in effort that in, in effort and applying energy when there's kind of an alignment between our motivation and then what we what we're doing like i was saying earlier at least for me i feel like a lot of the uh unsatisfactoriness around energy and effort is that there's often a lot of confusion or a, a sense of begrudging duty or whatever it is but in moments where there's a some clarity around oh this would be skillful this would be a, a skillful use of my energy now and then kind of then the system or the energy gets behind it that's maybe a definition for joy because it's sort of like that's what a human is built for in a way we have this energy and again it doesn't have to be like something amazing externally it could be Oh, in this moment, there's a lot of clarity that what's, what, be, what would be supportive is not doing anything and sitting down and really letting things settle and really being interested in the mind. Um, so that, you know, that's also an application of energy. Letting and kind of, it can be a self rejuvenating kind of energy, the energy of awareness. So ultimately, I think that's the direction we're moving in is being less identified with the kind of how energy is directed outwards and more like, because when there's, you know, say a lot of goodwill in the heart, we don't need to go looking for, you know, for goodwill because it's already there and it feels good and it's sort of energizing, it's suffusing, uh, it's, um, and uh, what would it be like to, to live from there? Okay, I've got this, goodwill, I wish well, and I'm going to wish well, I'm going to wish well while I'm, you know, doing my taxes or whatever it might be, but like it could be imbued with that sense, I don't wish anyone harm, I don't wish myself harm. So kind of, I think that's one way we can see that energy doesn't even have to sort of be in that mode of, I have this much energy and then I spend it, but sort of like this self, uh, um, rejuvenating source because where is the source of that energy anyways I think the source is in those wholesome motivations that give us that impetus like oh it would feel really good to be generous here oh it does feel good and then we just we can enjoy that I'll, I think this summarizes a little what I've been trying to say here. Ajahn Suchitto writes, putting appropriate energy into what you know is worthy will give rise to joy. Yeah. And so I think, yeah, again, like a lot of the, the work is that work of taking the time and pausing enough to even sense what is worthy. And I think, um, yeah, that's a whole arena for, for investigation and 
yeah, just to recognize that that takes time and energy itself just to make, you know, make the space in our life to let those, let that intuition sort of arise. You know, I think our society can be so um, biased towards activity. It's like, well, the important thing is just that you're doing something, not even what it is or, you know, that it's aligned or that it's useful. I mean, so much activity on this planet, but taken as a whole, it's destroying the planet. So it's like just more activity isn't necessarily good. It's what what's the direction it's going in. And this is really... This is, I think, maybe why clarity, wisdom comes before energy. Because once we have some sense of clarity, even if it, again, it's just like the most basic thing, like what's the next thing that would be useful to do? Well, make a meal for myself or whatever. But then we can really get behind that. Or walk the dog, you know, whatever it might be. But there's some, some joy there when we recognize that there's some, some clarity that then we can apply ourselves to wholeheartedly. <clears throat> so maybe I'll leave it here and so we have time to hear from each other. Um, maybe I'll just say one last point. Uh, yeah, I think I've mentioned this already, but see if I have a quote here. I think we can, like I've been saying, we can take this arena really personally. It's sort of like what defines us is our energy and uh, our effort. But from the point of view of seeing it as just nature, you know, maybe, you know, even the ways we get caught up in making efforts that aren't Ultimately, that's skillful. You know, all of that is just the system trying to take care of itself or the times we just want to numb out because, you know, it's too much work to be sensitive. But that's also a kind of energy. It's also a kind of effort. So all of that, that it's just nature. And and it's all kind of all those unskillful ways, either kind of over-efforting, like, okay, the whole world's on my shoulders. And if I don't, if I'm not perfect, then... You know, I can't relax. Or on the other hand, like, uh, I'm just a leaf in the wind. Like, I'm just a, a pawn in the, this vast universe, and it doesn't really matter what I do, so I'm just going to, you know, yeah, not, you know, think that it doesn't matter, or I don't have any agency, kind of. So both of those are sort of identifying with energy and either not, either really owning it and, like, I have to do it all, or it's too much work, or I don't want to have to be responsible. But from just seeing it as nature, it's just obvious that there is energy, and energy wants to move, and energy does move, whether in more or less skillful ways, so that that's all just kind of happening on its own. And then the role of wisdom and awareness is just to observe that, take in that data, and start to make the connections, or cause and effect. When the energy is applied in this way, with these motivations, it has this result. And, you know, either that's, that feels good or it doesn't feel good, leads to suffering or leads to release. So that even that process of becoming wiser about our energy and our efforts, that could also be seen as a natural process. Okay, I think I'll leave it there and see if people have comments or questions about anything I've said um, or just, yeah, examples from your own life of places you're learning about, maybe places where there's, there feels like there's joy, you know, joy in energy moving and just how, how yeah, how enlivening that is to feel alive, to feel like our life energy is moving unencumbered and there's no problem because maybe we feel aligned enough with those motivations. It's just like, whew. and uh, And then other times, maybe more common, where, yeah, it feels like 
something is stuck and um, energy isn't flowing or energy is flowing, but it's kind of circular, kind of doing the same thing and kind of caught in some way. So yeah, anything about this, be great to hear from people.